Well, I can't believe it's Christmas. It's Christmas, right? It's coming. It's coming fast. Who's ready? Two people. Two people are ready. <laughs> I'm not ready, and so I'm not one of the two for sure. But Christmas is coming, and as we started to go into this Christmas season, I started to pray to God about what he would have me speak about today, and I felt him give me a word. He gave me one word. <laughs> gave me one word, and that was hope. And God answered a prayer. I said, can you give me a word for the day? And he took me literally, and he said, hope. And I said, well, my countdown timer is going to be a little bit longer than what it would take just to talk about one word. And so I, I prayed and I asked him, I said, would you give me, you know, a little bit more? Would you give me a little bit more? What do you, what do you want me to, to dive in? And, and he directed me to a passage that we're going to look at today. And sometimes I think we, we ask God to do things and we, we fail to really go to him first in prayer. Anybody else ever make that mistake? We, we just expect God to do something and we don't really ask, you know? Sometimes we, we talk to everybody else about things that might be going on in our life. We talk to, to God about things that, or, or we talk to other people about things and we fail to go to God first. And this is a lesson that God's been teaching me lately just in my quiet time, even this morning as I was up early and I was reading and we're doing a 30-day a walk through prayer as, as a staff with some of the people that we walk with in our lives. And, and it's just, as we've looked at that, it's taught me one thing that I fail to go to God first in a lot of things. And so even as I was preparing for this message, I sometimes just expect to, to come up with something to talk about. But then I was like, God, can you give me something? And you know, he did. And so I hope that's an encouragement for you guys. That's not what we're talking about today. That's just extra, extra credit. I hope, you know, you can put some extra money in the drop box on your way out if you want to. But we need to learn to ask God, ask God for those things that we want. He, he knows our every need. Don't get me wrong. But sometimes he wants us to ask because that shows that we're dependent on him for our every need. And so whatever that looks like for you today, if you need help with your kids, ask. Ask God first. If you need help with your finances, ask God. Yes, you might get help other places, but ask God. Go to him first. And so that's what I did with this message. I said, God, I need you to, to show me what you want me to, to lead your people through. And he showed me this. And we're going to be in Luke chapter 2 this morning. And Luke chapter 2, as you know, as we're in the Christmas season, is a very popular chapter in Scripture when we get into the Christmas season. But there's, there's one person in this story that, that we don't talk about a ton, and I want us to look at his life today and pull some things from his story that I think we can apply to our lives. So let's read through this passage really fast, starting Luke chapter 2, verse 25. It says this, it says, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon. So Simeon's the guy. Simeon's the character of the day. He's the one we're going to be looking at. So there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And so moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts, and when the parents, that's Mary and Joseph, when the parents of Jesus brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, light for the revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. I want to speak today a message called Hope is here. Hope is here. Father, I pray that you speak today. I pray that these aren't my words, God, that they are your words, God. Would you speak through me? Would your Holy Spirit move? And God, would you have your way in this space today? And we promise to give you all the glory and all the praise when it's said and done. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen, church. 
All right. Well, let's go ahead and get going here. Hope, hope is a powerful thing, is it not? Hope is, gives us something to look forward to. It gives us something to keep our eyes peeled towards the future, to keep our, our attention focused on the horizon. Hope is a, a powerful thing. But I also think hope is a word we tend to just throw around a little bit in our vocabulary. It becomes just a normal word. We seem to normalize it a little bit. Almost like we do the word love, right? Our culture just tosses the word love around like it's not, you know, as important as it really is. And sometimes we seem to use it out of context. We'll, we'll say things like with, with hope. We'll say, well, I hope, you know, traffic isn't bad this morning. Or I hope the Chick-fil-A line isn't very long at lunchtime, you know, or I hope my fantasy football team does well today. How many fantasy football people do we have in the room? You probably got your phone out right now. It's like we're getting close to the playoffs. Are we in the playoffs yet in fantasy? Are we not in the playoffs? But you're like, man, I hope my fantasy football team does well. But hope, hope is a powerful thing, and hope goes a little bit deeper than just your fantasy football team and how bad traffic is going to be on a certain morning. It goes a little bit deeper than that. Some people are hoping for healing. Some people are hoping for a miracle and breakthrough. And so hope goes a little bit deeper than sometimes we maybe give it credit for. And, and what I want to talk about, the common, common theme about today that I want us to kind of wrap our head around here at the beginning before we set any more further into this is that the question is not what are you hoping for, but what are you hoping in? Just grab that for a second. Let that sort of settle in because that's going to be kind of a thread as we walk through this. It's not a question of what you're hoping for, but what are you hoping in? And so the, we don't want to answer the question of, well, are you hoping for the right things? That's not what today is about. But no matter what you're hoping for, whether it's healing or breakthrough or miracle, or maybe your marriage is on the rocks, and, or maybe you're having trouble with your kids, or maybe, you know, your bank account is running low, it doesn't matter what you're hoping for. That's not what we're going to really be addressing today. But what we want to address today is what are you hoping in? And I believe God has something in this passage for us that he's going to speak over us. And so we want to start. Let's back up to the beginning of this passage in verse 25. And we're going to walk through this a little bit at a time and see what God has for us here. And it said this at the beginning. It said, now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. And he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And like we said, hope keeps us going. Hope keeps us moving forward and it keeps our eyes looking ahead, but hope requires one thing. When we're hoping for something, it requires one thing. Can you guess what it is? Anybody? Anybody? It's in the verse. The verse is on the screen. He was, what was Simeon doing? Waiting. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. It took a minute. You're a teacher. You should do better than that. You want more out of your students. Be more. And so uh, he was waiting. So when we're hoping for something, it requires that we wait. Simeon was waiting on the coming of the Messiah. And if you know your Bible, we're in the New Testament. We're in the New Testament, and the New Testament starts off with the Gospels, which is the story of Jesus, Jesus coming, being born. And so that's the start of the New Testament. Jesus was foretold by the prophets in the Old Testament, hundreds and hundreds of years. And so if you're in your Bible and you're reading in the Old Testament and you go to the New Testament, it's a mere page break. It's a turn of the page. We're in the Old Testament. Now we're in the New Testament. But if you don't know, there was a 400-year gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament. 400 years where there wasn't a prophet in Israel. There wasn't, you know, anything being written. People were settling into where they were. They were settling into their routines. They were comfortable where they were. They were having kids. They were going through their daily lives. And there wasn't any prophet speaking the word of God during this time, 400 years of silence, 400 years of waiting. And here's Simeon on the other side in the New Testament, and he's waiting for that which the prophets had 
foretold in the Old Testament. For 400 years, they had been waiting for what God had promised. And I would imagine that during those 400 years of waiting, there were a lot of people that just forgot. That just forgot about what God had said. They had gotten comfortable in their routines. They had gotten complacent. They were just going through the motions of life and living and earning a livelihood and having kids. And they had forgotten what God had promised. And it's easy for us to forget, is it not? We are forgetful people. Yeah, Brittany's shaking her head. She's like, I know. She's probably shaking her head for Brittany, and, or for Jesse. I'm sorry. And so because here, here's the thing. We are very forgetful by nature. I'm very forgetful. I'm very forgetful. Christina reminds me of this all the time. And so I'll come in from, uh, she's shaking her head. She knows where I'm going with this. And so I'll come in from a day at work and I'll come in the house and I'll sit down and, and, and I'll ask her, be like, well, how was your day? And she'll tell me how her day was with Charlotte. And, you know, she'll tell me everything that they did. And, and I'll be like, well, okay, well, cool. What's, what's for dinner? What are we doing tonight? And she'll tell me. And then 40 minutes later, I'll ask her, you know, what's for dinner tonight? And she's like, what? I just told you. I just told you what was for dinner. And, you know, or I'll ask her something about something she already told me just a little bit ago, and I've already forgotten it. Any other men just do stupid stuff like that? You just, you just forget right after your wife tells you something that, yeah, some men aren't raising their hand. Their wife's pushing their hands up in the air. He's like, you should, you should be being honest right now with yourself. We are very very forgetful. And you know why we forget men? This is just between you and us right now. You know why we forget? It's because we're probably not paying attention. <laughs> there, oh, we, we got some ladies saying amen. We, uh, and now they're clapping. This is getting out of control, men. I'm really sorry. And so the reason we forget is because we hear it, but we're not listening. We forget it because we, we hear it, but we're not listening or we're not paying attention. And a lot of times why I forget is because I'll come in and I'll sit down and I'll either be on my phone. Anybody else get preoccupied with this little device that's in your pocket 24 seven, that's got news, that's got sports, that's got all the updates and you just get distracted by it. And she's saying something in the other room but I, and I hear it, that's not the issue. The issue is I'm not listening, I'm not paying attention to what she's saying. And so, God speaks, and God had spoken through the prophets that a Messiah was coming, and through 400 years of waiting, I'm sure there were those that had forgotten what God had spoken in the past, but despite the fact that so many maybe had forgotten the promises, Simeon stayed true. He remembered what God had said because he was paying attention. He knew the scripture. Look back, look back in verse 25 and what it said about him. It said, now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was righteous and devout. He was in God's presence. He spent time with God. He spent time in prayer. He spent time in God's presence, paying attention, listening to God and listening to what God had to say to him. He stayed the course. He stayed true to God. He stayed the path before him, and God honored that. I wonder how many of us, wonder how many of us when life gets stressful, when life gets uncertain, we seem to get distracted by everything that's going on in our life, and we forget the promises of God. Maybe we get distracted by people that are around us that are saying, this is unfair, this is unfortunate, God's forgotten about you, God must not care about you, maybe you've done something to make God really mad, I don't know what it is, but they distract us from God's promises. Maybe it's the circumstances you're in, whatever it is, we get distracted and we forget the promises of God. And sometimes, if it's not that, sometimes we get so busy hoping for something that we forget about the one who provides for us. Because remember what we said, it's not a question of what are you hoping for, but what are you hoping in? So maybe it's not that you're suffering from a lack of hope, but maybe you've got your hope in the wrong things. Here's my suggestion for us today. And this is our first thing. Maybe we all need to upgrade we need to upgrade our hope. 
We need a little upgrade. We're a, we're a culture. We love upgrades, right? We love the newest iPhone. We love the newest update. We love the newest OS. We, we love the newest gadget, this or that. We, we love upgrades. And here's what I suggest. Upgrade your hope. Stop hoping in the things that you feel like you need. Stop putting your hope in that which you are hoping for and put your hope in the one who provides that which you're hoping for. And that's what we need. We need an upgrade because it's not a question of what you're hoping for, but what you're hoping in. And what God is saying to us is he's saying, I've got something better for you. Yes, you feel like you're, you're hoping for this or that, and you can fill in the blank. Whatever that is that you feel like you need and that you are hoping for, God's saying, I have something better for you because God's promises always come true. God's promises always come true. Second Corinthians 1 20 says this. It says, for no matter how many promises God has made, and he's made a bunch of them. We've got a whole book full of God's promises. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. So what Paul is saying here is that all of God's promises will come true. When God speaks it, it's as good as true already because all of God's promises are yes in Christ. And that means they're going to come true. And then our response is what? Amen. And amen is a word that we, we say a lot in church. You know, all God's people said yeah, you know, that's just not a, that's not just a script we go off of. The word amen means, so let it be done. Let it be done, or so be it. That's what it means. And so when we pray and when we agree with those that are praying, that are praying when we get to the end and we say amen, we're saying whatever we said here, let it be done. In agreeance to what's being prayed and what's being said, let it be done. And so what Paul is saying here is that when God makes a promise through Christ, it's yes, it's going to be done. And then we utter an amen. And so whatever that promise is, whatever that promise is that you're clinging to, you can rest in the fact that it is yes in Christ. And so then you can proclaim amen. And, and like I said, the Bible is full of God's promises. God says things like, I will never leave you or forsake you. Doesn't matter where you are. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And so we say what? Oh, come on. We say what? Amen. I will never leave you nor forsake you. My God will supply your every need according to his riches and glory. All things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Amen. And so whatever God's promises are in Scripture, and we could go on. I've got a bunch of them in here. We're not going to hit all of them. But God has given us promises after promise in his word, and they are all yes in Christ. And then we say amen because what he says will come true. Scripture is full of his promises. And so my challenge for us today is stop putting hope in the things of the world and stop putting your faith in things and put your faith in me. That's why God's saying to us today. Stop putting your faith in things and put your faith in me. Because when we put our faith in God, we put our faith on a foundation that won't fail. We need to upgrade our hope. We need to upgrade our hope. And, and the problem is, and here, here's the problem. Like I said earlier, when we forget about God's promises, it's because we're not paying attention. It's because we're not listening. And I think so many times we blow through life, we blow through life, and we fail to pay attention and remember God's promises. We forget. 
But what we see here in Simeon's life is he's waiting on the consolation of Israel. He has not forgotten the promises of God. Despite it being 400 years since the last prophetic word, he remembers, God, I know you said a Messiah is coming, and I am looking ahead. I am looking for it. My faith is in you. My trust is in you. My hope is in you. I know what you've said. It's going to come true. I believe it in my heart. And because he believed in his heart that what God said was going to come true, God blessed him with a little bit of insight into, into what was to come. Because he stayed true to God, God gave him a little insight into his plan of salvation. Here's, here's how it works with God. Here's how it works with God is faith comes first, and your sight comes second. You know, I've always thought of faith as coming up to the edge, and you can't see anything else in front of you. It's completely black. It's completely dark, and faith is saying, I'm going to take a step. I'm going to take a step into the unknown. Even though I can't see what's in front of me, if God, you've t- told me to take a step, I'm going to take a step. And that's what faith is. God says, faith comes first and your sight comes second. And so here we see Simeon putting his faith in God, putting his trust in God first. And then came the sight. Look at this in Luke 2, verse 26. It says, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And so Simeon has put his hope in God. He's put his trust in God. He's put his faith in God first. And now the Holy Spirit is revealing to Simeon that he's going to get to witness seeing the Messiah. That which he has read over the longest period of time, over 400 years since the last prophetic word, he's going to get to witness and see that come true because his faith and his hope was in God. And so as I was preparing this message, I kind of have a a method to my madness when I write a message. And what I normally do is I will go and print off the scripture offline, and I set it to where we have really large margins on the top and the bottom. And then I sit down And before I open a commentary, before I open a dictionary, before I, you know, look up what different words mean or what different phrases mean, I just take a highlighter and I start reading through the passage that God's given me and I start highlighting key words and phrases and I'll take a pen and I might circle one word, I might put a box around another word and, you know, have different reasons for doing different things. And when, it, when it's all said and done, I have this piece of paper with this scripture on it that has lines everywhere. It's got scribble everywhere. Some things might be marked out and it's got just things that come to mind. It's almost like a, a brainstorming session on the piece of paper. And as I sat down here with this passage about Simeon, I noticed a theme as I went through this passage. And I don't know if you caught it earlier as we were reading through the entire thing. I noticed a theme and I don't know, can we, I just for illustrative purposes, can we go back to the, the main passage we read at the beginning, the first scripture, pro presenter is going to hate me, they're probably never going to serve again. But here we go, this, this is it. And let's see if we can pick up on a theme. It says, now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. Here's, here's our theme, just follow with me. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. Have we caught on to a theme that's happening in these verses? And what I saw myself highlighting was Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was on Simeon. And it was evident to me that God had blessed Simeon with the Holy Spirit. And I, again, if, if you don't know your Bible very well, the Holy Spirit fell on believers at Pentecost 
which is after Jesus grows up, he has his earthly ministry, he dies on the cross, he raises again from the grave, he ascends into heaven, and he promises that the Holy Spirit's going to come, and then the disciples waited, and the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost, and after that, from that time on, every believer, you and me, every one of us that are in this room that are believers in Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, but before Pentecost, the Holy Spirit functioned a little bit differently. It functioned a little bit differently. Not every believer had the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would fall on certain people at certain times to accomplish certain things. And that's what we have happening right here with Simeon. Even though we're in the New Testament, it's kind of like the Old Testament kind of way of dealing with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had fallen on Simeon and he was leading and guiding and directing Simeon's life. He had faith first and sight came second through the Holy Spirit. And so, Not only did Simeon believe God and put his faith and trust in God and his promises, the Holy Spirit is leading, guiding, and directing him. So by all accounts, Simeon was a quiet man that devoted himself to prayer and spending time with God. And because of this, God rewarded his faithfulness with this special insight from the Holy Spirit. Psalm 25 Verse 14, it says this in the good old King James Version. I loved how it read in that translation. It said, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. The secret of the Lord is with them. And I, I, I thought of this verse as I was thinking of this story with Simeon, how he was faithful to God. He feared God. He rested in God. He spent time, he spent his whole life devoted to righteousness and being in God's presence and spending time with God. And because of that, the secret of the Lord was with him. And God's given each and every one of us the Holy Spirit. That same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is is resting in, in us. We have to learn to follow the Spirit. Not only do we need to upgrade our hope today, and stop hoping in the things that we're hoping for, but put our hope and trust in God. We need to upgrade our hope, but we also need to follow the Spirit. We need to follow the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that leads. He guides and directs, but we have to be attentive to it. We have to be listening. We have to be paying attention. And I know that's tough. Like we said earlier, life is complicated. I don't I don't know if there's ever been a year where life has been more distracting than 2020. Anybody else testify that this year has just been hard to get any sort of rhythm to anything, let alone a spiritual walk? It's just been up and down. We've had services. We've not had services. We've canceled services, and then we have services again. And then we have services where we can touch people, and then we have services where we can't touch people. And it's just, it's confusing. It's hard to get any sort of rhythm It's hard to get any sort of rhythm, but life distracts, but we have to learn to keep our focus and our attention on God. And as we look at Simeon, we see that he was focused on God. He was paying attention to God. And the Holy Spirit is moving. He's leading and he's guiding. He's directing his life. And so then we get to the point in the story where Simeon gets to the day that he's waited his whole life for. Remember the scripture said that he was waiting. He was waiting on the consolation of, of Israel. And I don't know what went through Simeon's mind that morning when he got up, he strapped on his sandals, fixed him a bowl of cereal. I don't know what they ate back then. I don't know what they ate for breakfast. You know, I don't know if they had unleavened bagels. I don't know how that worked back then, but he woke up, strapped on his sandals, brushed his teeth, got ready for another day, probably had no idea that the Holy Spirit was moving him to that which he had been waiting for his whole life. And so the Holy Spirit, Scripture says, it says, moved him, and he went to the temple. And that same day, Mary and Joseph were bringing Jesus to the temple. 
And miraculously, the Holy Spirit revealed to him, and Simeon recognized Jesus. And then Simeon offers up this song in verse 29. It says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, what, is he, what, he had, pro- what had he promised? He had promised him that he would not die till he saw the promised one. He would not die until he saw the Messiah. And so, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. This was the moment. This was the moment that Simeon had waited so long for. God had promised it. God had promised him that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. This was the moment. This was the day. His faith became sight. For some of you, for some of you today might be that day. You woke up this morning, you got dressed, you got your kids out of bed, ate some cereal, I don't know what you eat for breakfast. You got the kids put in the car, you drove to church, maybe you're at home, maybe you're joining us online, you turned your computer on, you turned your phone on, you joined the chat, and you find yourself here today You find yourself here today, and just like Simeon got up that morning and he followed the Spirit's leading to the temple, to his destination, to that which God had promised him for so long was going to happen, but he didn't know when it was going to happen, how it was going to happen, how long it was going to take. All he knew is he had a promise on his life. And he woke up, and that was the day. That was the moment. And so maybe you're here today and you've been hoping for all these different things and I don't know what it is for you it could be a long list it could be a long list of things that you're hoping for but remember it's not a question of what you're hoping for it's a question of what are you hoping in what's your hope in What's your hope in? And so today is the day that I hope and I pray that your eyes are opened. Just like Simeon said right here in the scripture, it said, for my eyes have seen your salvation. And so for some of you today, maybe today is the day that you can say what Simeon said, for today is the day that my eyes have seen your salvation and I claim it and I believe it and I receive it today. I've put my hope in all the wrong things. I've put my hope in physical things. I've put my hope in the things that I'm hoping for. I've put my faith and my trust in the things that I'm hoping for, but I need to upgrade my faith today. I need to upgrade my faith to that which I'm hoping in. It's not a matter of what you're hoping for, but what are you hoping in? And today, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. Yes, we need to upgrade our hope. And yes, we need to follow the Spirit, but we need to fix our eyes. Fix your eyes on Jesus because he is our hope, not just for today. He's not just your hope to supply your financial need. He's not just your hope to give you, you know, uh, a, a fixed marriage or help with your kids. No, he is hope for eternity. He is someone that we can hope in, not just something that we can hope for. And he is our hope, and he's here today. As I finish studying and preparing this, like I said, I have a sheet of paper with all these different things highlighted and and marked. And there was one last thing I, I realized at the end of this passage 
And Simeon said, he said, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations. And then it said this, it said, light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Now that word Gentiles is interesting. It's interesting. See, the Jews were looking for the Messiah. Simeon was looking for the Messiah to come. But see, the Jews believed that the Messiah was coming to free the nation of Israel that was under Roman rule and opposition. And the Romans were the Gentiles. And so Simeon here, being in tune with the Holy Spirit, being aware of what's going on and what God is doing and having a little bit more insight into the situation, he used the word Gentiles. And that being the case, Jesus was coming for more than just what the Jews thought their immediate need was. Jesus saw beyond their immediate need to be rescued from being under Roman rule. He didn't come to just meet their earthly need. He came to meet their eternal need. And it's interesting, that which they were hoping to be rescued from, they were hoping that the Gentiles would be destroyed, that the Romans would be destroyed. But God said, no, I'm coming to shed a light on them, to give them a light for revelation. I'm coming to save them too. And so their earthly need was a Messiah that would free them from Roman rule. But Jesus came to meet their eternal need. And as I was thinking about that, as I was thinking about that, my, my mind went to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well that Jesus encountered when he was in his earthly ministry. And there's a story in John chapter four, and we won't, you know, look too much in detail at this, but I'll give you a quick synopsis of what happened just for time's sake. But Jesus encounters this Samaritan woman at the well one day at lunchtime. And he sends his disciples on into the city and he sits there at the well. And this woman comes to the well and she starts to draw water and Jesus asks her for a drink. And she looks at him and she's super shocked that he would talk to her because Jews didn't associate with Samaritans and Samaritans didn't associate with Jews. It was not, it was, it was frowned upon, you know. And so she was shocked. Jesus is addressing me and she says, who are you to ask me for a drink? And Jesus told her, he said, well, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me for a drink because the water that I have to give, if you drink that, you'll never thirst again. If you drink the water that I have to give, you'll never thirst again. And so she, she says, tell me a little bit more about this. And he said, well, I tell you what, go go get your husband and then come back. And she probably drops her head a little bit and she says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, you're right. He, in fact, you've had five husbands and the man you're living with now is not your husband. And she's shocked. She, she's shocked at what he's telling me because what he's telling her is true. What he's telling her is, hey, I, I know you, I can see past it all. And at that point, her eyes are open. She says, well, you must be a prophet. And Jesus goes on to tell her who he was. And she, she said, well, I believe that a Messiah is coming. I know that the prophets have written. I know what the prophets have said. I know a Messiah is coming. And Jesus looks at her and he says, I'm he. I am the one you're talking about. I'm here. What he was telling her was hope is here. Hope is right here at the well with you. Hope is here. And he told her, he said, stop putting your faith and your hope in your failed marriages. Stop just trying to cope with your current circumstances. 
I haven't come just to give you what you're hoping for. I've come to give you something to hope in, and that thing is me. So stop putting your faith in that which you're hoping for, but put your faith and your trust in me. I'm the one you can hope in. I'm the one you can trust. I'm the one you can rest in. I'm your hope and your answer and your rock and your salvation, and I'm here, and therefore your hope is here. Stop hoping and putting your faith and your trust in those things that you're hoping for, but put your faith and your trust in me. It's not a question of what you're hoping for. It's a question of who you're hoping in. And our hope should be in Jesus. Our hope should be in Jesus. I'll leave you with this verse. Hebrews 6, 19, it says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul. That's good news. That's good news, is it not? In a year that has been so uncertain, there's been so much chaos and confusion and fighting and sickness. Jesus said, I'm your hope. I'm an anchor for your soul. I'm firm and secure. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul. It's not a question of what you're hoping for, but what are you hoping in? What are you hoping in today, church? That's something to ask yourself and and wrestle over. We all hope for different things, and that looks different for you than it looks for me. And it looks different than the person that's sitting next to you. We all hope for certain things, but our hope should be in Jesus. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Father, we thank you that you are here and hope is here and hope is in this room. And I don't know what each, what each and every person needs today, but I do know that we all need hope. And God, may we stop putting our faith and our trust in those things that we're hoping for. May we not get distracted by that which we're asking for or get distracted by everything that's going on in the world around us. But God, may we keep our eyes fixed on you. God, would we learn to follow the spirit and God, would we upgrade our hope to to see that you are our hope. You are our rock and our salvation, and we can rest in you. We can rest in you today. Whatever we need, God. God, we're not just in a place where we are hoping for something or just hoping we can get something out of you. God, we want you. You are the one that we hope in. God, would you minister to, would you minister to us? Would your Holy Spirit move in this moment? Amen. Amen. Church, let's stay. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.